welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hello, and welcome to GoTo Book Club once again. Uh, my name is James Lewis. I'm a director at ThoughtWorks, and today I'm delighted to be talking to Anmesh Joshi about the release of his new book and the patterns within it, uh, Patterns of Distributed Systems. Uh, Anmesh, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Anmesh Joshi, and uh, I work as principal consultant uh, at ThoughtWorks. Um, been with ThoughtWorks uh, close to 16, 17 years now, uh, and last several years uh, and been thinking and writing about distributed systems <laughs> and we'll cover more of that i think as we as we talk <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah and you see i mean that's that's a fairly long time to be with with it in, in a consulting organization can you tell me a bit about the background maybe with maybe some of the some of the experiences that led you to become interested in um in in, in distributed systems and the sort of experiences you've had that led you down this path because i mean frankly this is this is a, a lesser trodden path in you know the software engineering literature, certainly the sort of uh, the more sort of I guess user friendly literature, um, because it is a it's an it's it's regarded as a really difficult topic. So oh what, yeah, what were the experiences that led you to this? Oh yeah, it was a interesting journey. I would I, I would say so. Um, I mean, as I, I think any any professional uh, for last several years uh, working with cloud, uh, I mean you see. Um, services and products um, you use on cloud or even in your data centers that are that are distributed by nature, right? I mean, you use Kafka, uh, you use even simple things like Amazon S3. Um, and I had been using, um, like everyone else, um, some of that. Um, and I was al always like curious, I mean, why, why now and why they are designed the way they are, but, uh, but I never, um, spent more time on um, going going in depth or in, in details um, until the point where uh, uh, like around I think 2017 um, I, I got a chance to work on a very interesting project I and mean, so we uh, we were involved uh, uh, in developing software for an optical telescope um, and that's that's going to be one of the largest telescope uh, once it goes live called 30 meter telescope um, and naturally, because it was a telescope ecosystem, um, the software that we were developing, we could not use off-the-shelf products. Uh, I mean, we used frameworks yeah. like Akka, um, but we had to do a lot of uh, uh, lot of framework development ourselves. Um, and it turned out um, uh, just because multiple telescope subsystems need to coordinate and uh, and you need to keep data that's highly available and also consistent. <laughs> Um, what we were building uh, turned out to be a distributed system, um, uh, and at, at at that point, uh, I, I mean, I, I kind of had to go in in, in depth of um, how these things are built and um, how they work, um, and uh, all the literature. I mean, the the books and yeah. academic papers uh, that are out there. I mean, you you. Um, I mean, you're essentially going back to Lamport, aren't you? you know, that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And we, we'll talk about Lamport's, uh, 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 I mean, Paxos and other things. Um, but a lot of that, I mean, it, it took a lot of, uh, I mean, you need to stretch your imagination uh, yeah. when you read something um, and, and then you go and, say, start writing Java code. <laughs> how, do you, how do you map things? Um, and uh, what I started doing uh, at that point was, uh, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, the, uh, to test if you really understand something uh, yeah. is is to write code uh, and to run that in production. I mean, that's the ultimate test always. Um, but then I thought it 
it might be easier if I look at code that that I mean there are a lot of open source uh, uh, frameworks out there like Kafka and uh, Cassandra and stuff like that. Th th those are open source tools, uh, and they are battle tested in production. Um, so why not go and look at their code and start to make sense? I, I try to make sense out of it uh, and and see what the building blocks look like, um, so that it's it's also a good validation of some of what we are building if it if it matches um, with some of the decisions that are taken there um, as well um, and to start with it was it was hard obviously because you, you can imagine you 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 open a Cassandra code base <laughs> you don't know where to start <laughs> uh, uh, really um, so I what I started doing was um, uh, I mean I, I I just thought if I need to build Kafka Kafka yeah. like thing uh, what all things are needed and maybe look at some of the earlier versions of Kafka um, and it's um, I mean it's good thing with open source that you need you can go through the commit history and and uh, generally you see that some of the earlier versions of all these complex products uh, they are simple uh, because uh, and, and easier to look at um, so I, I went through those um, and I tried building my own miniature versions uh, of these products. Um, and that naturally, uh, because I, I looked at multiple of these, yeah. um, I could I could figure out that, okay, there are similar things happening, non, even if not exactly the same. Uh, yeah, there are yeah. similar building blocks um, in core that, are, um, that you see. Um, and I, I just happened to, talk to Martin, uh, Martin Fowler uh, about it, uh, that yeah. this is the approach that I'm taking in uh, for learning how, how distributed systems work. And, and I also tried teaching uh, using code um, because we had, um, we were attempting to um, teach more developers um, about distributed system concepts. And we, uh, we also had some, some college professors uh, taking sessions for, uh, for our developers. Um, but it, it, I mean, it never worked well because, uh, as I said, there is a gap between the theory uh, that you uh, that you learn and, yeah, and the code. Right. Um, so this more code-driven approach uh, of if you need to build something that is a distributed key-value store, let's say, um, uh, what building blocks you need to think of uh, and how they look like uh, in, in in code, and and that worked pretty well, um, and that's when. Um, Martin thought that I think uh, it patterns approach is probably a better because because you see things which are similar but not exactly the same. Yeah, but they they cover a broader range, um, uh, broader broader range of implementations uh, out there. Um, yeah, so that's that's how it started uh, really. That's you, you touched on a number of things I find quite interesting there. I remember a conversation I had some years ago. With Brian Getz about um, the job concurrency book he wrote, and I was, I was sort of amazed at how he got into it. I was like, oh my God, because it, it became the Bible, right? If you're working in yeah, yeah. Uh, multi-threaded systems in Java, you, you, you everyone had that book on their shelf. I said, said, Brian, you know, how did you, you know, how, how come, how came you to write this book? You know, were you this expert, massive expert in concurrency? And he said, yes. She said, no. Um, it turns out I wanted to learn how it worked. Um, <laughs> and so I thought the best way of doing that was to. Was to actually start writing the stuff down and, and, and start start writing that you know start writing code to work out how it worked for myself and it turned into the Java concurrency book and it seems like a very similar <laughs> thing that you oh, yeah, got it, it is curiosity it is. really yeah yeah I mean it it was uh, more like demystifying um, some of the words that you I, I mean you 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 read Lampard's clock and yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to see I mean where, uh, how does that look in code and and where it's used. Yes, because I mean, uh, uh, joking, you mentioned the Lampard's papers earlier, uh, yeah, a minute or so ago, um, and actually, they, you know, they, they genuinely are actually that, that, that them and the Liskov papers, and the, you know, going back, you know, generate almost like two generations of software engineers now. Um, they, they really are, but, but also they're academic. They're academic in nature, so yeah. um, it is fascinating how you've taken taken those ideas and actually brought them into into um, into a form that you know. So regular Joes like myself, regular software engineers like myself can understand, right? You know, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a pretty pretty staggering achievement, I have to say, Amesh. So first of all, thank you from everyone for doing it. 
Um, the other thing I think you talked on there, which I thought was was quite amusing in, in a sense, was this um, this idea that I, I think it's a very uh, it's 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 typical of many of our colleagues. I think it's 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 one of the reasons I think I loved I love working with ThoughtWorks, which is this this idea that the way you the way you you, you really get to understand something is by turning it into code and running yeah. it in production. Um, it's almost like you know, well, you know, Richard Feynman. You know, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, he used to say about, you know, the way you understand something is by teaching it to others. I guess yeah. this is like the strong version of teaching it to others, right? It's actually, you teach it, <laughs> teach it, right? Where there is no misunderstanding, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have, um, I've seen it so many times and maybe, uh, maybe uh, it's just me, but I've seen it with uh, most of the professional developers that uh, you, uh, you understand things uh, and, and that's, Maybe uh, the nature of software development uh, itself that you, uh, I mean, you, there's a limit to how much you can specify and imagine things uh, on yeah. a whiteboard and maybe with some abstract concepts. Um, finally, when you, when you write code, you, uh, you get more insights and then you can reflect on those ins insights and then maybe go back to specifications and, and stuff like, I mean, that's just the very nature of software development, I think. Um, so if if we were to I guess come back to basics, right? So when we say distributed systems, what do we mean when we say distributed system? What what makes I know maybe it's a it's a silly question, but I mean yeah. uh, let's let's come right back and what, when we say distributed system, what is that what does that entail? Well yeah, I mean that's a great question, um, I think because um, because people interpret distributed systems <laughs> uh with their own context. I mean a lot of yeah. I mean microservices ecosystem itself is, I mean, can be called as a distributed system as well. And, and Kafka is a distributed system as well. And cloud is a distributed system as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, what uh, I primarily have focused on is uh, essentially uh, when you have um, data systems, I mean, you need to maintain state and you need to maintain it on multiple servers um, to keep make it available and then you need to make sure that uh, that state is consistent um, across servers um, and wh whatever systems um, and, and obviously you, ne you need to shard or partition that state so that you can have lots and lots of data um, stored and processed um, so I think uh, what I have focused on are uh, is on this kind of systems uh, and, and things like Kafka, Cassandra, Amazon S3, Cosmos DB, and uh, I mean all the data uh, data things. So really, we're talking in terms of cat theory, and we're talking and correct me because I, I might be wrong here, but um, in terms of cat theory, we're talking about consistent systems, consistent, as yeah. opposed to available systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there is always a balance. I think that. Uh, that all these systems, um, they, I mean, they, they, like Paxos, for example, uh, also is available as long yeah. as the majority of the um, servers are available. Uh, but beyond that, it will just favor consistency. Mm. Uh, cool, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, maybe let's talk about. I you, mean, you mentioned briefly about the about patterns. Um, the what? Why did you go for the patterns approach to start with? Why not just go for you know, writing your own piece of software, essentially? And well, why not release your own Kafka, right? And say, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so patterns, uh, I thought, was uh, was a useful approach because uh, let's say if you have to build something like Kafka, um, the concepts that, um, that you need to know or need to implement, um, there is a lot of similarity between, for example, when you, when you, uh, implement something like Cassandra. I mean, even if not exactly the same, or yeah. or uh, you are implementing something like HCD, which is a raft uh, raft implementation. Yeah, um, there are a lot of common concepts uh, between say raft and Kafka's replication uh, mechanism. Um, so patterns approach what what they allow you to do is uh, is talk of this similar concepts that span across multiple implementations, um, and then then they uh, then they become more uh, more useful, uh, I think, because once, for example, uh, there is a concept of uh, let's say high watermark uh, yeah. that when, when you are replicating a log, uh, you need to really demarcate which uh, portion of your log is like stable 
it's not going to change and which post portion is volatile i mean it might change if your nodes crash and leaders change and and stuff like that now that high watermark concept uh, whenever you use log replication like in kafka um is also there in in raft which is called as a commit index yeah um and whether you use some other um uh, replicated log algorithm like view stamp replication um or or multi pack sauce uh, which which no one has documented how how it's implemented but uh but you need back break in this point right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but you need some concept like that and once you know what that concept is and how it's typically implemented uh you read a, a raft paper or a view stamp replication paper or uh, or or kafka's uh uh replication mechanism you know what's going on and you 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 can connect the dots so and so i mean so you mentioned rafting paxos obviously yeah. these are i mean probably these are these are names that people have heard bandied around or di- different messages of saying consistent in the etc etc um yeah so i mean just to put you on the spot here you go describe the differences between raft and paxos for us <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah absolutely I, and and i think that's that's important because uh, you see that uh paxos uh the microsoft and google folks <laughs> and all the services uh, they have they always mention that they implement paxos uh for replica consistency and all the open source world um says that they implement raft uh and if you read paxos paper uh, the original uh paxos made simple or other papers uh what it describes is uh, uh what is called as a single decree paxos like uh how multiple nodes achieve consensus on a single value right um so in the literature what's understood as paxos and i have actually documented that as a pattern so i i documented paxos as a pattern because uh, we thought that 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 whole that concept uh, that you need two phases to uh, reach an agreement uh, between nodes uh, then you use majority quorum to make sure that the decision taken by the previous quorum is is visible uh whenever you try next um and you have something called as um i mean what i i have documented as a as a different pattern called generation clock so you uh, all this coordination is done by you know, a leader which is called as proposer um uh, in 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 paxos um and you mark the leadership with monotonically increasing number so that if there are i mean you always tolerate multiple leaders but you can always cut off older leaders so you on, only the latest leader can make progress so this basic mechanism um, of how to combine these concepts of uh, epochs or generation clock um, two phased execution um, and then recovering from uh, let's say partial rights um paxos documents that uh, and how to do that for let's say a single request uh, or a single value you mentioned some I'm going to do if I just interrupt because you mentioned something really wish we should probably it's maybe this is not the right time we can come back to it but you mentioned something like the latest we told we told multiple but the yeah. latest and yeah, that right. kind of cuts to the heart of the, of, of the problems with distributed systems doesn't it yeah we will we'll talk about uh, so okay. so that latest comes in <laughs> uh in 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 various um uh various different um areas of uh, so what what is the latest value i mean in, in terms of paxos when i say latest leader i mean w- what is the leader that has just won the election let's say um which has the latest epoch or the latest generation clock and it can it it can be the only leader that can make progress um so uh, so these concepts uh how they work together is is documented in in paxos and um in literature mostly it's documented how to do that for a single value uh, or a single request um but obviously one of the one of the uh, side effects or, or or one of the issues with this basic mechanism is this basic mechanism is uh, what you can call as initialize once so once you reach an agreement um you cannot have another request or another value that can be chosen so it's it becomes immutable after that um and that's even if it's 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 um it's a good way to understand the basic mechanism and how how to structure 
um, that basic mechanism to reach yeah. an agreement. Yeah. It's not very useful in practice if you have to build a database, for example, right. because you, I mean, you you need to update values multiple times, and if you <laughs> to maybe execute requests uh, like um, like register release uh, in in uh, when you implement something like it's CD, um, and the the mechanism to do that essentially is to um, is to arrange all your requests um, in in an ordered log. Uh, and you can imagine again that if you execute this basic Paxos, Paxos mechanism on each entry on this ordered log, yeah, um, then you know that all the nodes will reach agreement on each entry. And then if they execute these requests and follow that log order, um, they will execute all the requests in exactly the same um uh, same order and then they will reach exactly the same state so obviously this basic paxos mechanism like like two phases and establishing the epoch uh, by by quorum voting yeah um it's not very efficient naturally to if you do it every time you get a user request um and you need to optimize that um for any production implementation and um, generally that's that's what happened in in practice. I mean, whenever someone says uh, that they they implement Paxos um, for implementing, let's say, uh, uh, replica consistency in in their database, uh, mostly they are using something like um, uh, like a replicated log mechanism, right? Um, and that replicated log mechanism essentially then then combines this this basic Paxos um, to elect a leader at startup, yeah, and then all the requests essentially are are ordered in the log. Uh, this this single leader does that. So it's not like for every request you go and try to establish a leadership. Yes. Um, and then it also combines um, things like uh, high watermark that that I talked about. That you uh, you demarcate your ordered log so that you know what is the uh, what is the stable portion of the log and what is uh, what is the not so stable portion uh, and raft essentially um, details out how to do that uh, with all the nitty uh in in the implementation so essentially raft is 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 a an evolution um, towards practicality practicality of yes. the basic paxos algorithm when i say basic paxos algorithm it's not yes. basic at all um, <sighs> yeah, i mean it reminds me uh, I think I shared with you previously uh, uh, an article that James Mickens, the uh, the former Microsoft distributed systems researcher, oh, yeah. wrote in yeah. Newsmix magazine on, on Byzantine generals and Byzantine. Byz <laughs> <laughs> new Byzantine generals algorithms yeah. are popping up all the time. And how, frankly, they're pretty simple. They're not simple. Pretty simple. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it brings me actually. I mean, because you talked to you talked about it, a couple of things there um, relating to. Well, I mean, in my mind, relating to time, but I think that's something crucially we do have. Yeah, we should probably talk about because it's at the heart of the problem with distributed systems, isn't it? Oh yeah, um, how you manage time across multiple different processes, multiple different um, systems. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and 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 very interestingly, I mean, um, uh, as you know, uh, Google has this uh, timing infrastructure called True Time uh, with atomic clocks and 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 GPS. Uh, and stuff like that, and and uh, it, it, I mean, good thing uh, thing to know uh, is that even with atomic clocks and all the infrastructure that Google has, um, when they have data centers across the globe and 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 servers span uh, uh, so far, um, they, they they cannot get exact uh, uh, clocks exactly matching. So there is there, there is always a delta, um, yeah. and um, and what essentially Google does is um, is make sure that 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 delta between two clocks um, is minimal. So it's seven milliseconds, I think, uh, is what they guarantee. Um, but essentially, practically, it is not not. Uh, I mean, you will never get two servers to agree on um, on same time, um, and that's one of the big big issues. And uh, I mean. Obviously, Lampard clock is is one way, uh, and I have documented uh, in the book uh, how Lampard clock works. I mean, you essentially just maintain an integer, um, and you pass along that integer with every request, and then every server 
um, receiving the request um, also keep keeps track of what value it's getting and what is the value that it has and uh, and when i'm saying um, i mean typically in databases you can imagine um, if it's a key value store or um, or let's say even uh, um, your document store your document is considered you can consider as a value or in your rdbms your row uh, you can consider as a value um, so you you store uh, this version with with that value uh, or with the with the primary key or uh, with the key of um, uh, that value um, and then comparing uh, these values uh, sorry these keys or these numbers um, attached to the keys you can you can figure out which update happened before another one uh, i mean that's a simple lamport clock mechanism and now as you can imagine um, in in databases that that uh, that we all use uh, if we have to compare integers uh, to know which values are are ahead and and later it can be quite uh, confusing um, so most databases combine this technique this basic lamport clock technique of tracking the integer um, uh, with actual date and time um, that that you get uh, on your servers um, and that's called as hybrid clock so um most your databases like mongodb and and yugabyte db and cockroach db i mean you see that um, um uh, in practice they use something called as hybrid clock right um and and that allows you to combine uh, this this system time with this integer um that can um, that can track uh, which values are getter uh, after <laughs> the other uh but yeah i mean it's fascinating and i i i think uh, it's something that people will find um, exciting when they read in the book how th- how this is typically implemented i, I mean there is work. a simple java code um, that i have in there you mentioned spanner um, i remember maybe our friends at, at the at the book club at goti can um, can dig this out and add it to the uh, to the notes because i remember seeing some of the spanner engineers talking about it Oh, you, so you, you talked about tree time and Sp- cloud spanner is the yeah, the 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 database implementation that makes use. One thing to add there, so so the, uh, just an example of how this patterns approach is useful. I mean, what what what's done in true time um, yeah. or with the use of true time in spanner um, is essentially uh, that you get this, um, let's say, uh, maximum delta between two clocks. I mean, how how, how much. Uh, clock how, values how much drift there is essentially, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, what? How you can use that essentially is to, uh, if you are writing a particular value at a particular time, let's say you are writing a value at time five, uh, and you know that it will take maybe five hundred milliseconds to. I mean, I'm just giving an example value. Five hundred milliseconds is too too high to wait, <laughs> but uh, within five hundred milliseconds, all the other servers in the cluster. Um, are going to get that 5 uh, pm as the value so what this writer does is it is it waits for 500 milliseconds um, just to make sure that everyone else has that clock value uh, or time value and then it makes that value uh, visible or th- then it writes that value at that time stamp so if if you can um, if you know how much that maximum uh, skew between or across uh, servers in cluster uh, can be um, then you can implement it uh, without true time as well i mean that's what most of the open source databases do uh, i mean they assume that maybe the clock skew uh, the max drift um, uh, maybe 200 milliseconds uh, within your aws cluster um, and th- and then they then they can just implement that wait uh, for uh, for 200 i mean True time just makes it um, makes it more practical. Saying yeah. uh, it 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 won't be more than seven milliseconds, so you can actually wait for seven milliseconds. It's not and then bang. yeah, it offers you a guarantee essentially. Yeah, Very yeah. Easy. I mean, I, I I remember I remember the talk. It was a fascinating talk they they gave. They they had this this quite amusing uh, a sort of portion of it when they were talking about cat theorem again. Back to cat theorem, um, right. and they, they were talking about how how they they are consistent and available. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and they said, "Oh, you know, t- 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 it, it, it turns out we've broken cat theorem." That was the start of the talk, um, and at the end of the talk, they said, 
actually, we haven't broken Captium at all. It's just that we never partition. <laughs> our networks are so good that we just break partition, which I thought was a, like a quite an amusing kind of a dead, like a appendix yeah. at the end of <laughs> of the talk. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky understanding things at implementation level. I think uh, how it helps is you. Uh, you get this kind of intuitive, and I mean, even if you don't read specifications and you don't know exactly uh, how these things work, uh, you get this intuitive understanding. So if if something breaks in production, for example, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, you need to make sense of uh, what might have happened, uh, you you at least have some pointers um, like this. Um, and I've given this example, and I think a lot of people give this example that there, there was this Cloudflare outage. Um, I think a couple of years back, uh, yeah. uh, and the outage was uh, essentially because uh, the HCD uh, server that they they were using it um, um, there was outage in that, uh, and then there is this inherent issue with Raft's uh, leader election, um, and and I mean it can very well happen with any basic consensus implementation that um, you just keep on electing leader and no one no one can make progress, and that's that's. Uh, I mean, it can very well happen unless some care is taken. Um, but if you are aware that, okay, something like this uh, might happen, I mean, it might happen in your Kafka cluster or it might might happen in your Kubernetes cluster as well. Yeah. Uh, we are we are all fortunate that we <laughs> things don't fail that, that often. It was, I mean, just talking about failure, because I mean, failure is, I think, one of the, one of those, I mean, the, the edge cases in these in these systems are, I mean, there's lots of them. And they're pretty sharp. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. sharp edges. And I, I, I don't know if you've come across. I'm sure you have come across the the Jepson suite. Of oh tools, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Which uh, are useful. I mean, that's that's provide that that's provided me with hours of entertainment over the. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I, I mean just to compare uh, the patterns approach uh, with so Jepson. Um, I mean, it's an excellent tool and. It, it takes a black box approach, so it, yep. it treats your products as black boxes, and then it runs uh, some tests and uh, and introduces failures um, in between. And in patterns, is uh, I mean you can think of it probably as a white box approach. So you know what the building blocks look like. You can maybe think through um, some of the issues that might um, you might face. Well, I think I mean I think probably you could look at the failures that the Jackson detects, and then you can yeah. describe them in terms of Failures yes. in the particular implementation of a pattern, can't huh? you? I mean, that's a, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I guess that's come comes back to the the actual implementation, right? So it comes back to the fact that the the book is rooted in in code. It's rooted in 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 actual code that is executable, is unit testable, um, and uh, yeah. and you can you can inspect yourself. I think that's a really important part of the book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I, 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 and that is the reason I think. Uh, so, before writing um, each of these patterns, uh, I had actually working Java code, uh, and Java as a language I chose. I mean, just because it's uh, more people familiar with it, <laughs> yes. and simple language. All there the is no other reason. <laughs> Even the C sharp people are familiar with Java. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, then I made sure that I. Explained pattern around this basic Java implementation that's uh, uh, that's out there, um, and tried not to do um, not to use pseudo code uh, to explain the code structure. Maybe we should maybe chunk up a little bit now because I mean we're we're, we're in the weeds. We're talking about clocks. We're talking about you know not in the weeds. We're in the, we're in the details, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. For me is the fascinating part of all this. But I guess we can maybe take us take a step back because. Um, you know, I think I think many people working in our industry at the moment, right, would are coming across the distributed systems more and more. Whether they're using them, whether they're like yourself involved in implementing them. I mean, you know, whether that's for telescopes or whether that's for point of sale solutions or whether, you know whatever it is for in the always on world that we're in. How would you sort of recommend? What would you recommend to someone who is interested in going a little bit more deeply into this? How would you sort of recommend them to 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 proceed to go forward? Yeah. So so one of the um, one of the goals for this patterns uh, work um, as well was um, was that someone reading this material uh, should be able to navigate 
open source code bases um and i think navigating i mean following open source products and um, and um, and going through their code bases trying out maybe isolating some pieces of it and playing with it um i think that's that's a great way to learn uh, about distributed i mean particularly topic like distributed systems um it's a great way to learn because um if you go down the route of theoretical understanding i mean there are a lot of nice books um i would say but um but you might get lost yes <laughs> right <laughs> so so i think it it helps a lot to remain closer to code uh, while you are learning stuff one of the things like i saw again really likes about this is it opens up a whole new set of patterns to do a whole new generation of people i think right so and it, i and because it because as you say that that because they are patterns because there is code there it gives us another set of tools or rather it exposes the tools that have been there but that then you know but that have been used by systems engineers generally right, right? right and i think you know that is i mean obviously my background is in i would say sort of distributed systems you know in terms of microservices and uh and that kind of yeah. thing yeah um but not at, i mean you know i've i've myself I've, i've i've implemented some of these patterns myself and um but but i'm i'm we are probably in the minority right um yeah but that's i think what's really useful about this is it it's it's opening these patterns up to a much wider audience and are making them available oh well, yeah absolutely absolutely i would say uh, so like like something as um as widely known uh but not well understood as as two face commit <laughs> i think <laughs> some of us just anyway <laughs> yeah so i i have documented uh, two face commit uh, in here as well and and um, some of the nitty gritties of what might go uh, go wrong and how it's solved in um, in modern implementations um, and knowing something like that i mean i mean these scenarios come in your microservices implementations as well i mean at a different level of abstraction obviously but yeah <laughs> not, not yeah. Right. But, uh, but, but yeah 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 or or things like id important receiver i mean i have a pattern called as id important receiver and it's it's i think in any microservices implementation you will uh, you will need that and and getting some clues and ideas of how let's say kafka and um, and and it cd really implements this id importancy um it it opens up you know because I have a whole new set of whole whole, yeah, whole yeah. new yeah. approaches because I mean yeah. we talk about item potency a lot but then people sort of it's one of those things that people f- forget to implement and then go oh uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but there was this thing that I forgot it's <laughs> what I didn't notice oh yeah absolutely um, absolutely okay so um, I guess we we should sort of uh, think about um what what's what's next now well, one question I had what what did what have you found most surprising what while going on this journey oh what's so surprising I think one of the most surprising things is I mean all these things are out there so many years and um and there are so many implementations now at least um but they are not I mean I I was surprised that these are not well known things um and I, like like Paxos for example taught in academy for 20 plus years <laughs> and still you required a new phd thesis <laughs> <laughs> to document document something called as raft uh, and even before that there was uh, uh, there was view stamp replication algorithm which was which is exactly like raft uh, just no one knew about it is so surprising that as an industry i think uh, uh, we i mean these things were not well known yeah <laughs> for yeah, some yeah. reason well thank, thank you very much um so what's what's next now the, the book is out congratulations by the way i think it's it's destined to become an instant classic um so I mean, I've I've really enjoyed reading it it's been this certainly just widened my eyes open my eyes uh just to to, to say this because it's so practical because it's so um it's so readable and so accessible so I think it's a really important contribution you've made I want to say thank you um but what's the next, what's the, what's next for you but, yeah I think just going back through some of the patterns i mean i see a lot of scope for improvement on some some of those so I maybe uh we'll take take a stab at improving some of these patterns um um and also i will i think continue uh, i'm i'm um 
I, I, I did a couple of workshops uh, teaching Paxos and Raft uh, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm planning on extending uh, that. I mean, have more workshops where people can actually play with code um, and try out some of these things. And are you planning on? We should. I should mention that um, obviously the the original repository of these patterns was on martinfowler.com or a lot oh, yeah. of them. Um, yeah. Are you planning on continuing that work as well? Yeah, I think I think I will continue on that. And I I wish I get time to continue on that. As a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but we're looking out for look out for you in a workshop near 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 you. Um, and uh, I guess yeah. I mean, go get the book, everyone. It's 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 brilliant. It genuinely is. So. I just want to say thank you so much, Amir, for joining us on, on Go to Book Club to talk about patterns of distributed systems. As I say, I think it's destined to be an instant classic and is full of like just fascinating detail on 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 how the things that run our world work actually, right? Because that's really what we're talking about here. So, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, thank you, James, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. No, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic for me to get the opportunity to talk to you. So, and thank you to GoTo and uh, the GoTo Book Club for organizing this. Uh, you can see this. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. <laughs> <laughs>